I realized, Oh no, <laughs> I have made a grave error. Hey guys, how's it going? Tis another day of art. I'm currently sitting in a closet full of crap right now. So excuse me if my enthusiasm is a little is, is not as high today. I'm just trying not to whack my shins on boxes at the moment. So we're in the process of moving my sister this weekend and the house is kind of in shambles. So anyways, in today's video, we're going to be bringing out the markers again and seeing what happens. <laughs> Make sure to watch through till the end to see the final reveal. So I feel like slumber parties are kind of a quintessential part of growing up, if I'm <laughs> if I'm using that word correctly. <laughs> this is a problem of mine. I use words that I don't fully understand. But anyways, I don't know. Let's just go with it. We all have this kind of nostalgia towards slumber parties, and I really wanted to try my best to capture that in an illustration. I started this sketch, like many others, for a class assignment that I did not finish. So, but I figured this would be a fun one to color with markers, so I finalized the details and shoved it onto my mixed media paper with my handy dandy little light box. As I was finishing up the sketch, I decided to put this little bandana girl character in it, which you may recognize from some of my previous videos. The more characters I have in a scene, <laughs> the more I tend to get overwhelmed <laughs> trying to come up with an entirely different character design for each of them. And I figured, why make this harder on myself when I have a perfectly good character design already readily available? So that's what I did. It's okay to make things easier on yourself sometimes, contrary to popular belief. So the brainstorming process for this piece was a lot of me just sitting and thinking and writing things down and scrolling the Pinterest. <laughs> ah, my best friend. Also asking some of my friends for their ideas too, and some things I actually pulled from my own memories, which is a great form of reference for art. But some things I decided to add is more of just an ideal, I guess, for slumber parties. For instance, watching movies or playing Mario Kart were always activities that my friends and I did when we had slumber parties, but I really wanted to take devices out of this scene. Obviously, there is nothing wrong with watching movies. I clearly have an affinity for watching movies. And of course, there's also nothing wrong with playing video games, but I just kind of wanted to keep this piece free from more like man-made things. No, that's not right. There's a lot of man-made things in this scene. I guess I wanted the piece to have a bit more of a vintage vibe, so I decided not to include those specific memories. However, music was a must memory for this illustration. Unfortunately, I did not actually have a record player growing up, but after painting this- I can't read and everybody's freaking walking around upstairs. I told you I was recording. <sighs> Finally, stillness. Anyways, let's continue. So unfortunately, I didn't actually have a record player growing up, but after painting the one from Luca in last week's video, I just really wanted to do another one, so we went with it. The sketch for this piece is available as a coloring page this month on Patreon, so make sure to tappy tappy the little Patreon link in the description and snag your coloring page. I'm pretty sure food was the first idea I started really thinking about. I know. What a shocker. But the girl with the Chinese takeout came to mind first, and I was always the little piggy at slumber parties, <laughs> so I shamelessly based her off of me. And of course, no slumber party is complete without sweets, so I decided on like a cookie, candy, charcuterie board type situation, also a little pint of ice cream with a design ode to Ben and Jerry, and ices. Like I said earlier, a lot of the things in this scene are actually little pieces of memories for me, not necessarily linked to slumber parties in particular, but just memories of me and my friends growing up together. <coughs> One friend I had always did the best braids on our hair, and to this day, I'm convinced she sold her soul to the devil because I cannot do the braids that she did. Another friend would 
always eat all of the cookies, no matter what flavor they were. One friend would always get ices with me anytime we hung out, and another friend always ate all of my ice cream, even though she was lactose intolerant. There's a little bit of bittersweetness to this scene for me, knowing that I included pieces of people that are kind of basically strangers now, for lack of a better word, but I think that also kind of lends itself to the piece too. The friends you have don't always stick around, but it's so good that they're still a part of some of your favorite memories. So because I had given the girls slightly vintage pajamas, I decided to search for vintage color palettes as well. I came across this kind of retro 70s color palette on Pinterest, and I was like, This. This is the one. This is the child of the prophecy we must use. So I did. I also wanted to have this kind of, not really ethereal, but like close, cozy, <laughs> cozy mood warm lighting from the fairy lights. So I made sure that the palette was also conducive to that. <coughs> I played around with the colors in Quitta. Quitta. <laughs> in Quitta. I played around with the colors in Krita so that when I went in with the markers later, there wasn't too much guesswork involved. Like I've said before, alcohol markers are very permanent, so you either need to have a game plan going into it, or be entirely okay with creating crap. As I have done many times. So as I started coloring this piece, I unintentionally colored the middle girl's hair red. Um, I, I work next to a very sunny window and it looked right in the sun, but when I closed the blinds, I realized, oh no, <laughs> I have made a grave error. So that needed to be fixed. Thankfully, going darker is always relatively easy with alcohol markers, so I wasn't overly concerned. Now, the real concern comes later with a very unfixable mistake, but we're not there yet, let's stay in happy land. A lot of working with markers for me is getting my base colors down first and then going back in for the details. I've also discovered that I work best blocking in my shadows first with an object or a character, but I always have to go back to those shadows later because they can kind of get a little bit fuzzy from where I've gone over it with lighter colors. Obviously soft shadows are also very important in an illustration, but I always make sure to go back in and crisp up the shadows a little bit in areas that have gotten a little lost <laughs> during the process, um, especially in areas of particular focus. It's a whole process, but it's what works for me, so, you know. Because I decided on a warmer color palette, I knew I couldn't just do straight up blue for the ice cream and the ices. A true blue would be um, obnoxious, <laughs> to say the least. So I instead went with a base of cool gray with a layer of cool green over the top of it. Because this mix is the closest on the color wheel to blue in this scene, it kind of just naturally reads as blue, which is cool, <laughs> like magic or science, I guess, but that doesn't sound as cool, so magic. I wanted to really test myself with the skin tones in this piece. My own skin basically just looks like it's never seen the sun, which is fair, as this is me on a daily basis. Anyways, I've just always drawn super pale characters since tan is the more kind of American ideal. Um, I guess I just wanted to feel better about myself. But I wanted to challenge myself and branch out a little bit for this illustration. I looked at a lot of reference photos for the middle girl because I realized that I haven't really drawn a lot of people of color and there are entirely different rules there. For example, the highlights on darker skin are much brighter than they are on paler skin. There's a high contrast versus pale people which kind of just look flat. In real life and in art. <laughs> Uh, anyways, um, I attempted a bit more of a peachy skin tone for the girl on the right, again as it's not something that I generally do. I also used a few of my fear markers in this piece and found out that they really aren't that scary once you start using them with other colors. I actually used some pretty vibrant warm peaches on her, but because I paired them with neutrals too, it ended up working out pretty well I think. 
Coloring the snack board was definitely one of my favorite parts. I tried to play around with the textures of the different goodies to help distinguish between them, especially since so many of them are this kind of beigey brown. Carbon brown, I guess. One of the things I think I really struggled with in this piece were the shadows. Because there's this overhead lighting, the whole space is pretty well lit, so there's really only shadows right up underneath the characters where the light isn't hitting directly. But then there's also bounce light from the yellow blanket that they're sitting on, which bounces back up into the shadows a bit and relighting them from below. So I got very confused and a little frustrated, but in the end, I think we got there. I struggle a lot with my marker illustrations feeling kind of flat, so I really tried to play around more with the colors in this piece and do my best to bring it to life. So the idea for the space they're in was a blanket fort, but my mom asked me partway through if it was a treehouse. And honestly, you know, I can see the resemblance. I briefly debated on taking the piece in a different direction and really playing up that tree trunk branches thing idea. But in the end, I stuck with my original idea and I'm calling it a blanket fort. My actual favorite part of this illustration was playing around with the colorless blender. Oh boy, did I have fun with this. Contrary to the name, the colorless blender does not actually blend. A concept that took me years of pain and torture and just utter confusion to grasp, it is definitely a misnomer. But now I understand its capabilities for textures and effects, and let me tell you, that stuff is fun. I wanted to have these kind of glow spots from the fairy lights shining through the blankets, so I took a risk and just dropped the colorless blender juice directly out of the bottle onto the page. It was magical and I liked it very much, so I went arguably a bit crazy with it, but I was having fun, so you know. I also tried dropping it onto a patterned paper towel to add some more unique textures and that opened my eyes to the possibilities with this stuff. We've come to the part of the show where Allie pitches a literal fit. Complete with paper throwing and possibly a couple of tears. Thankfully, I don't have any footage of this incident. I digress, it was traumatic nonetheless. So I had the nerve to set my illustration down on my bed, and I remember very clearly the thought, Eh, it's fine. I'll be careful. It's not like I'm gonna sit on it or anything. I remember those words going through my head. <laughs> and a little while later, I laid down on my bed for some good old chill time, only to realize that my leg was crushing the page the entire time. So now there's a lovely little divot on the right side through the tree branch. Excuse me, the blanket. And along the girl in blue's calf. So that was incredibly irritating, but also a little bit of a life lesson on making better choices. Thankfully, it's not overly noticeable, but I notice it and that's upsetting. Anyways, moving on. So I mentioned earlier that my sister is moving this weekend, so these past couple of weeks have been a little bit weird for art lately. I've been keeping up with my scene studies, but I've tried to be a bit more relaxed with my personal art projects since things have been a little bit more hectic. One of the things I did do over the past week though was play around with clay. I follow a lot of miniature sculptors on Instagram and the stuff they can create with clay is just absolutely insane to me. So, so I bought some clay and I gave it a shot. I'm sure it comes as no surprise to you that the first things that I tried were all food, but you know, it's what I like, so. <laughs> I will now be making a complete career pivot into sculpture. I'm kidding, of course, but I really did enjoy giving it a try and I'm so excited to keep working with it. There's so much texture and life you can add to clay, and I think this is also really gonna help with my illustrations as well, kind of helping me familiarize myself with how textures work in different lighting scenarios, and also learning how light interacts with shapes. 
I really want to try sculpting my little PB&J loving character Bobbles at some point. Thankfully he's made of very squishy basic shapes so I think it's going to be a really good starting point. It's just kind of nice to try an entirely different medium of art and take a little bit of a break from painting and drawing. Of course, I love painting and drawing, but it can also be pretty draining to do the same creative thing over and over again, so it's been nice to just take a little bit of a break. But anyways, let's get back to the illustration. I always intended to bring in colored pencils toward the end of this piece, so I made sure not to try to detail too much with the markers. Although alcohol markers do dry quickly, the more layers of ink you add, the longer it takes to dry, and the more ink bleeding you'll get in that area. <coughs> Pro tip, take your time. But anyways, there are just some things that are better achieved with colored pencils, at least for me. I've been looking a lot at the design aesthetics of Cartoon Saloon and classic Disney movies lately, so I really tried to look around the scene and see where I could bring in more textures similar to those movies. I added some stitches to some of the pillows and some little dotty spotty bits just to break up the flat colors a little bit. Definitely not as cool as they do it, admittedly, but we're learning, so. At this time, I was really trying to figure out how I could bring both realism and magic to the piece. In reality, there's a lot of grays and muted tones in the world, so shading with vibrant colors isn't really a good way to add realism to an illustration. But on the other hand, shading with a lot of gray can feel very dull and lifeless, so I always try to find a good balance between the two. Adding pops of more vibrant colors while still trying to maintain a sense of realism. Obviously I don't mean realism as in like, oh my gosh, this looks just like a real person in a real room, but more so like the vibes of the scene are something that you can relate to. I also went in with gouache toward the end to liven up some of the highlights where colored pencils just couldn't really brighten it up anymore. Fun fact, you can actually use a swipe of alcohol marker over the top of gouache without reactivating it to tint your highlights. Obviously don't like rub at it for too long, but a quick swipe won't reactivate your gouache and leave a streak. <coughs> oh, I drank all of my water. So sad. Anyways. I have no idea what I was talking about. Karate buckets. Oh yeah, so if you've watched some of my recent videos, you probably have noticed a little bit of a pattern in some of my illustrations. I really like adding these little, like, light dust bits. To me, they just feel really magical and kind of help create more of a flow in an illustration. So I added some of those in this piece as well. And with that, the illustration was pretty much finished. Maybe a couple of tweaks here and there after I let it sit for a couple of days, but overall I was really happy with this one and told all of the stories that I wanted to tell with it. Thank you guys so much for watching, and if you made it this far, let me know one of your favorite slumber party memories. If you like my art and want to see more of it, make sure to subscribe because I upload a new video every Friday. Thanks again for watching, and I'll see you next week. Bye guys!